The Big Bang Fraud The Scientific Evidence Against the Theory by Malcolm Bowden What is the Big Bang Theory? This is the proposal that many billions of years ago a tiny quantity of very dense matter exploded. As it enlarged and cooled, matter eventually condensed out. Then it collected together to form atoms. These formed into stars, and they collected to form massive groups of stars called galaxies. These galaxies then collected together to form superclusters of galaxies. As the universe continued to expand, the galaxies moved further away from each other. And the further away they were from our galaxy, the faster they were moving. Imagine the universe is like a huge balloon with dust particles inside it. As the balloon expands, every dust particle moves away from its nearest neighbours, and the further particles will be moving very rapidly away from those near the centre. Watch the three coloured galaxies and their relative movement. The Big Bang Theory arose from an observation by Professor Hubble that the further a galaxy was from us, the larger the increase in the wavelength of its light. As a galaxy moves away from us, its light appears to be shifted to the red end of the spectrum. This is known as the redshift of galaxies. The change of the light is because as the galaxy travels away from us, its wavelength is longer. It is redder. The faster the galaxy moves away from us, the greater the redshift of particular lines in their spectrum. From the amount of change, astronomers can tell how fast a particular galaxy is travelling away from us. And Hubble found a relationship between the distance a galaxy is from us and its redshift. From this, they could easily work out how long ago the Big Bang took place. This figure has had many huge changes, but the present figure is 13.7 billion years. Thus, the whole theory depends upon the redshift being an indicator of a galaxy's distance and its speed away from us. But, is this correct? Halton Arp was investigating quasars which are very bright bodies with very large redshifts, so they must be a very long way away from us. But then he found that many of them had a small wisp of material between them and a galaxy, indicating that they were quite close together. The problem for the Big Bang Theory was that the galaxy generally had a very much smaller redshift than the quasar. He found that this was not a coincidence. The number of cases was far more than random chance. One quasar with a high redshift was in front of a galaxy with a much lower redshift. The quasar should have been over 90 times further away than the galaxy. Other galaxies showed a similar connection between a galaxy and a quasar with a huge redshift. The obvious conclusion was that redshift is not due to the speed of recession, but due to some other factor. He also found that there was often another quasar on the opposite side of the galaxy, as though the galaxy had expelled two quasars in opposite directions. Furthermore, as the quasar moved away from the galaxy, their redshift reduced and their brightness increased. So there was clear evidence that redshift was not an indicator of speed of recession, and this should have demolished the Big Bang Theory. But what actually happened? It was as if a huge button had been pressed around the world to prevent this evidence gaining credibility in conventional science. Firstly, his telescope time was removed preventing him from making further observations. Secondly, his papers were not accepted by the main science journals. 
and in fact his detractors made vicious comments about his work. Thirdly, he was not allowed to use an X-ray map of quasars in his book without permission. Fourthly, the scientists' writing papers that supported his views were refused publication. Finally, such was the opposition that these objects were excluded from examination and photos were even cropped to remove them. To have academic freedom, he moved to Europe and to bypass these barriers, he wrote a book called Quasars, Redshifts and Controversies in which he presented his evidence and how he was subsequently treated by orthodox scientists. In a subsequent book, Seeing Red, he gives his views of the opposition he faced. I give just two quotes. If you take a highly intelligent person and give him the best possible elite education, then you will most likely wind up with an academic who is completely impervious to reality. Science is failing to self-correct. We must understand why in order to fix it. On the first point, I think he is wrong. There is nothing inadequate in the abilities of those who opposed him. The reason for their opposition was that his evidence threatened their Big Bang theory that they had supported for many years. They were well aware that if the Big Bang theory fell, many carefully constructed speculations and careers would fall with it. And there were even more important theories threatened that we will deal with later. On the second point, the peer review system ostensibly to remove frivolous or bad articles, is actually used to ensure that only papers that support the present orthodox accepted theories are published. That is why his work was crushed. There are other proofs that falsify the theory. If redshift is a measure of distance, then there should be a straight line correlation between these two measurements. In 1976, Tift accurately measured redshifts and he found that they were in distinct steps of 72 kilometers per second or half of this value, 36 kilometers per second or one third, 24 kilometers per second. This showed yet again that redshift was not a measure of recession but of something else. The creationist Barry Setterfield has shown that these steps are due to the atomic properties of the atom as the speed of light was decreasing over time. As the Big Bang expanded, the disposition of matter should be extremely uniform, but it is not. It is clumped into stars, galaxies and superclusters of strings of galaxies, and many of these are centered upon the Earth. Astronomers have great difficulty in explaining all this, but that they have an insoluble problem rarely reaches the public ear. To account for this grouping, they have invented cold dark matter to keep the stars together. To make their theory work, there is said to be ten times more of it than there is of the visible matter of the stars, etc. Yet no one has ever seen or measured it. It is pure speculation stated with great assurance in order to deal with the problem of the lumpy distribution of the stars and galaxies. In 1992, the Cosmic Background Explorer, COBE, satellite plotted the temperature of the background radiation. This was gravely announced as the Holy Grail of Science as it would explain how stars and galaxies formed. However, it only found differences of one thirty millionth of a degree, and even this was only produced after many corrections and subtractions. It is far too small to explain the present distribution of matter. Creationists have shown that this low temperature is easiest explained 
as the energy from the millions of stars warming up the dust in the ether. Calculations show that it would take about 6,800 years for it to reach the present temperature, which is not far from the biblical age of the Earth and Universe. In 1976, Varshney collected quasars into 57 groups with similar spectra. He then found that each group had the same redshift. This pointed to quasars forming concentric shells around the Earth, making the Earth effectively the centre of the universe. Further research supported his claim. Searching on Wikipedia will show how much his work has been dismissed, for it says his works are, quote, rarely cited. We can guess why. Later it was reported that Varshney had recanted from his claim, but this he flatly denied. It demonstrates once again the depths of underhand ploys and dirty tricks that the opposition will stoop to in order to destroy any evidence that damages their conventional theories and that places the earth at the centre of the universe. So in summary, Halton Arp showed us that redshift was not related to the galaxies moving away from us. Tift showed that redshift was emitted in steps and was not continuous. The low temperature of the background radiation was so uniform that it could not explain how stars or galaxies could have formed from the initial Big Bang. And finally, Varshney showed that quasars were in bands of similar spectra centred on the Earth. What more evidence is needed to demolish once and for all the Big Bang theory? If the Big Bang is destroyed, as we hope we have proved, evolution is destroyed with it, for it relies on it to provide the huge time spans for evolution to take place. So let me conclude by warning young people about to embark on a career in science that should they enter any field that has even the remotest connection with the three subjects of evolution, the Big Bang, and relativity, that if they discover anything that contradicts any of these three theories, they will find themselves under immense pressure to change their evidence, or their results will not be published and they will be ostracized by their peers, as Halton Arp discovered. Many have found this to be true, including Professor Dingle when he criticised relativity, Eddie and Bournesian with their data showing that the sun had been shrinking for centuries. New Scientist, May the 22nd to the 28th issue, 2004, page 20. In this issue was an open letter signed by 34 scientists who complained that criticisms of the Big Bang Theory were consistently blocked. They also said that it is supported by so many fudge factors that it would at least raise serious questions about the validity of the underlying theory. And many other scientists have had similar experiences. In these areas and many others, science is far from being the objective search for the truth wherever it leads, as it is riddled with intrigue, prestige, love of money and academic politics. This applies to many other subjects also outside of science. Never forget that it requires only a few men to control funding boards, magazine editorships and the major institutions to ensure that these three theories and other sacred cows will be protected at all costs from any serious criticisms. Why should this be? Because they are all denials of God's very obvious hand in creation and therefore fundamentally anti-Christian. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you for listening.